All right, welcome to the last example from chapter six. It's the second full example with the force of gravity involved, and it's one of many examples where we are thinking about circular motion and centripetal acceleration. All right, so we have the International Space Station orbiting above the surface of the Earth. So we have the Earth, we have the orbit, very poorly drawn circle, and we want to recognize that the radius of this orbit, just like in the previous problem, is the height above the surface plus the radius of Earth. And we will be given the radius of the Earth in um, any reference sheet we need for tests or exams. And it's in the slides um, that this original picture was presented in. All right, so first of all, that height, 400 kilometers... If we take one kilometer is equal to 1,000 meters, we get that this is going to be 4 times 10 to the fifth meters. So this radius is 4 times 10 to the fifth meters. The radius of the Earth is 6.38 times 10 to the sixth, also in meters. And so the radius here which we will use throughout the problem, is 6.78 times 10 to the sixth meters. So I will underline it just like before, and we're going to use it throughout. All right, so this question is simply asking, what is the time period of this orbit? But there are a lot of steps to get to between what we have right now and what we're trying to do. First of all, we always need to recognize that the forces involved are the thing causing the circle. And in this case, with the International Space Station right here, the force of gravity, which points towards the center of this circle, wherever centripetal acceleration is pointing, is the only force. In orbit, gravity is the only force acting on the objects that we're going to be dealing with in Physics 125. So when we think about the net force being equal to mass times the centripetal acceleration, and I'm going to make sure that we kind of recognize that that is what we have started with in every single problem that we've seen in Chapter 6 uh, since introducing the idea of centripetal acceleration. Gravity is the only force on the left here, and mass times v squared over r is a valid way to write the centripetal acceleration. And you'll notice that we do not have the mass of the International Space Station. We have to recognize that the force of gravity is the capital G, the constant of universal gravitation, the big mass, that's going to be the mass of the Earth, times the little mass, that'll be the mass of the International Space Station, all over the radius squared, keeping in mind that we've already solved for that. The small mass here is the mass of the International Space Station because that's the thing that is going around in orbit, v squared over r. So... When we look, we can divide both sides by the International Space Station mass, and it will cancel out on both sides. Now we can plug in the numbers that we have and start to solve for what we're looking for. Okay, so G is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Mass of the Earth is 5.98 times 10 to the 24. The radius is the one underlined on the left over here, 6.78 times 10 to the 6th. That is squared on the bottom over there. And this is equal to v squared over this 6.78 times 10 to the 6th. All right, so if we plug all of this into our calculator and we multiply both sides by the 6.78, times 10 to the 6th, we will get one number that we can then take the square root of. So when we solve for v squared, we get 5.88 times 10 to the 6th, 
times 10 to the 7th. Huge number, but helpfully we're taking the square root. And so we get V is 7670 meters per second. That seems huge, but remember, we need to be moving at incredibly high speeds to be able to be circling the Earth with such a strong force of gravity. All right, that is not what we're being asked for, but it's important and necessary because the speed that we've just found is equal to 2 pi r over the period that we're solving for. So we get 7670 equals 2 pi, and then the radius is still this radius way over here, 6.78 times 10 to the 6th, all over our unknown time period. So if we multiply both sides by this time period that we're looking for, 2 pi, 6.78 times 10 to the 6th, we can divide by 7670 on both sides. And then we have the time period t all by itself. We plug all this into our calculator because this is canceled. All this goes into our calculator and we will get a number in seconds that we probably want to put into minutes or hours so that we can tell if it makes sense or not. 5 1,550 seconds, rounding to three significant figures, which is equal to about 93 minutes. So, like I said in the previous example, um, which was about 88 minutes, the International Space Station does take about an hour and a half to go around the Earth every single time it goes around the Earth. So it is whizzing by, and it's pretty neat that you can actually look for the International Space Station, and on a given evening, you might be able to catch it a couple of times. There's factors that go into whether it's visible or not, um, but there are apps that actually tell you when it's visible. So all of the physics that we're learning right now, it might feel very different and strange, and a lot of students kind of get overwhelmed, or they kind of psych themselves out by seeing all this um, uh, scientific notation, but this is describing actual motion of actual objects. And so when you get a chance to, the next time that you're outside for a while at nighttime, um, if you look at a an app like Heavens Above, you can actually tell when that, you can actually look up when the International Space Station is going to be overhead and watch it really go very quickly through the sky recognizing just how far it has to be traveling every single second that we're seeing it in order to have a height of its orbit of 250 miles. So it's pretty awesome. And um, this really just goes to show how versatile the tools that we are building in this class can be. Certainly, we're unlikely to be solving for the time period of satellite orbits in our future careers and jobs but the ability to apply a problem-solving process using skills and toolkits that we have built is something that we'll be using throughout our lives, and hopefully we can be seeing these skills develop as we apply them to specific situations. That's it for Chapter 6, so I will see you in Chapter 7. Thanks for listening.